Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. Okay, it's, uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here today, our sixth year of natural resources. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, normally we speak about how good we are and uh, how good is the performance of our funds. Today I'm going to talk more about failure and a complex market and a complex investment and uh, balance sheets and issues. So it's going to be a bit different uh, than usual. So you know us, we are a value boutique. Uh, and I'm going to suggest something which is relatively new. We are mixing value with natural resources or commodities, which is quite unique. And I'll try to explain how. And the second message here is uh, we are willing to stay as a boutique uh, in order to you know, meet you investors and have a transparent and, and good relationship for the long term. So we don't plan to be very big. We want to be an investment boutique. And it's, this is our strategy. In terms of performance, you can see it. Natural resources is up 77% per year in the last uh, five, six years with the cycle against us. So it's basically in line with what the sector does uh, long term, uh, as we saw in the earlier presentation. That is the team. Uh, so I wanted to put this in contrast with the failure. So here you have people with more than 30 years experience in research, UBS, Credit Suisse, Mary Lynch, uh, Harvard PhD. Uh, Carlos is in the 60s, the rest of the team is in the 50s, so we are not new and we are making everyday mistakes because this sector is one of the toughest sectors where to, to be invested. Philosophically, we, uh, you know us, we think as entrepreneurs, uh, not kind of investor or speculators, we invest long term, we try to protect capital, this is key for us, and we are learning the hard way in this sector and we are applying value, right? So long-term investing is the only way to make money here. And this is our basic kind of principles, strategic value. We try to understand the strategy and we apply the value philosophy. We do a lot of research, circle of competence. This is pure Warren Buffett. Long-term, long-term, long-term. I will say this word a lot and more in this sector and responsible investing. So investing in commodities is extremely complex. So uh, I ask you to read this. A mine is a hole in the ground with a lion in the top. So this is a starting point. Every time, I'm sorry, we have uh, representatives here from, from natural resources companies and oil companies, but it is true because these guys need capital. And even if they have reserves or not, it is their business. So they will oversell what they have. And this, you learn it with the years. Uh, in the beginning, you try to believe on the resources, 2P, 2C, whatever they say you, but, but the reality is this, the, that you need to really cross-check what they are saying. So this is really very complex, and you have people overselling you the story, and it is extremely complex. Why it is so complex? You need to know geology. So not many people here are geologists. I'm not geologist, so, you know, the first approach is, ooh, what happens here? It's very complicated. It's not the same for copper, oil, or whatever other commodities. Uh, we have 25 commodities. It's not the same. You need to understand uh, API, uh, permeability, grade, uh, decline, etc. And it's very technical. It takes a lot of time. And then it's almost impossible to double check. Uh, we were once in Canada uh, in a conference and and one company there showed us the drilling logs, kind of the samples they took from the, from it was an oil sands company called Nexen 10 years ago. And when we saw the logs, you wouldn't see a black color. It was full of stones. You know, you don't have this chance in everything investment you do. You don't have the chance to go there, to go to the field and see the drilling results. Basically, this happened once in, in my life. We saw that and we didn't invest. So the full thing was full of stones. A Chinese company bought Nexen in Canada and probably they didn't look at these logs because uh, it went bankrupt. Basically, there was no oil in the reservoir or very difficult to, to extract. And then geologists, you can hire geologists. I'll tell you another anecdote. We did a huge due diligence when uh, shale oil appeared in 2010, 2011. We spoke to maybe 10 geologists over the months, and the conclusion was shale oil is not uh, going to produce a meaningful amount of, of oil. 
well, 10 years later, is 10% of the, of the full supply of the, of the world. What happened there is that these guys did a good analysis because in the end, their conclusion was this is not commercial at these prices, okay? So the conclusion was not wrong per se, but if you believe them and you go full geology, you m can make a lot of mistakes. So this is another reference. Geology is a reference. So you need to know geology and you need to have a deep knowledge on the sector and on the, and the financial. Obviously, the sector is not very well understood. It's a long cycle. You lose engineers because it, when you have a downturn, it takes 10 years and people leave. The UBS team of oil leaves. And then, you know, the sector is not really well understood. You need to model not only the companies, but also the sector. You need to understand supply, demand per commodity. You cannot generalize. You have low visibility, OPEC. What is the information we get from OPEC, for instance? You don't get the full clarity on what is going on. Huge volatility, which you know messes up everybody. So you do numbers, and in the end, the volatility can kill you. You say something, you say oil price incentive, incentive price is 90, and the next day, you, something happens, and oil prices uh, goes down 20%. So you lose your kind of uh, uh, credibility, exactly and knowledge disappears in downturns. When you have a 10-year downturn, uh, knowledge disappears. Long term, this is key for investing in natural resources. Look at this, this is Grasberg in Indonesia, 4,000 meters. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, copper mines in the world. This used to be a mountain, so they have kind of a scrap half of the mountain. Uh, I mean, this takes, I don't know, uh, 20 years to develop. You need to invest 10, 15 billion uh, dollars. And then, you know, uh, when the market is a little bit oversupplied, prices go down and it takes time to, to balance. Uh, and the contrary is true. When the market is under supply, prices go, go up and they stay ver very much uh, a long time there. So, you know, there is a full mismatch between the equities time horizon, which is a quarter or two quarters, and the commodities. Volatility, I, I don't have to tell you. I mean, we have a company which the name is Hot Bay Minerals. This is what you see in the chart. Volatility is 2.2 times the market, which means that, you know, an investor normally is scared about the equities volatility. So this is scary. Imagine twice. So our, our natural resources funds, you have days that is up 2 or 3%, then days of minus 2 or 3%. And it is what it is because, you know, the traders know that this is very volatile and they use it, they play it. When China goes well, they go long. When China goes wrong, they go short, and it moves a lot. And so also, it's only a short-term financial thing. The problem is that it has an impact, because the, the investors ourselves, we get scared. And, and you know, it's what we call a cocktail sector. You have commodity prices, and you have the operating leverage of the company. Higher prices, a lot of profit. Lower prices, the profit com comes down a lot, and then financial leverage. Um, it is very inelastic. So this is back to what Carlos was commenting. The most commodities, demand and supply are very inelastic. So prices move a lot. Volatility is very high. And finally, and importantly, risk. Um, so these cycles are long cycles. Uh, they call it boom bust, boom bust cycles, uh, because you know uh, they move up, you stay there for 10 years, move down, you stay there for 10 years again. Managements are capital seekers, so they oversell the story. You have country risk, what Alberto was mentioning, resource nationalism, uh, the taxes, royalties, uh, new regulation, etc. So really, it's a risky sector. And then on top of that, you have ESG, which is raising uh, the, the, the level of effort these companies need to make and what uh, the market is, is asking them. So conclusion, and this is an easy message. Very difficult sector to analyze, very difficult sector to invest because you need to be long term and be there when, when prices are down. And uh, it's very difficult to model. Uh, there's a duration mismatch and uh, uh, volatile and risky. So, you know, uh, <laughs> it's about the introduction, but you can make a killing if you are in the right moment because valuations are so low and cycles are so long that if you are more or less right on timing, you can make a killing. And this is what we think is going to happen. Let me talk briefly about the... So all this is a complex investment world. Let's make it more complex. We have three cycles. So you have the... This is what we call the mambo time. So it's a kind of big mess. You have oil prices, 120. Then you have COVID. They go to minus 20 for one day, then back to 100, then back to 70. So it's a kind of... No, nobody really 
understand what the hell is going on here. Same with nickel, you have the, the numbers there from 10,000 to 50,000 per ton. Same with coal, multiplying by four with COVID. So, you know, in the end, the investor says this is uninvestable. And in our opinion, not everybody is invested in this sector. Actually, we think that it's this very, very, very underinvested from an equities and uh, from an industrial perspective. Then we have the, the big cycle. So there's three cycles. Uh, the investment cycle, so this is, so you have the, for the, take the mine as an example, you have the mines running and demand is growing. At some point, there's not enough uh, copper. If it, there's not enough copper, you need a copper price that incentivizes new miners. So copper price goes up. This incentivizes a new mine. The problem is that you need a license, then you need uh, all the approvals, then you need to build it, blah, blah, takes 10 years on average, okay? So prices go up because it's under supply and demand is inelastic and they stay high to incentivize new supply. 10 years later, you have the contrary. There's a lot of mines. These mines start to produce. There's oversupply because there is a crisis. Prices go down and the exit barriers are very high also. People do not close the mine, never or almost never which means that you are in a downturn for another 10 years and we've seen copper at $1 a pound for many, many years and, and you will see now the cycle for oil as an example. So this is from the 80s down cycle until 2000. So this is almost 17 years. The up cycle from 1998, 99 to 2011 more or less, so another 12, 13 years. And from then, uh, from then, a down cycle that we think is over. But, you know, the message here is this is the cycle. It is the fundamental cycle. Long term, it takes decades. And we think we are starting a new one, or we started a couple of years ago. Then we have the economic cycle. So all the complexity of analyzing this thing, you, you have the long term cycle that you need to understand per commodity. And then you have the economic cycle that you know more than me. So we are in a world that is cyclical and every five years or six years you have the economic cycle. So you have the long term curve and then the economic cycle every five years. So this is completely messing up the picture. Um, and finally, the short term, right? We have commodity prices, which basically are a financial tool in order to speculate or make money short term. So there's a bunch of traders and, you know, very, very, uh, you know, knowledgeable people following oil, following gas, following everything. You have Trafigura, you have Vitol, you have really skilled people making money out of this because they know that you have uh, pricing um, differences. So you can make money, you can do arbitrage and also because they follow the macro and if China goes wrong, then this is the easiest uh, short because you know it's going to fall a lot and it's going to go up a lot. So there's easy money for the trading. So now I'm adding to the complexity, the long, the middle economic cycle and the short term speculation cycle, which in the end uh, explains how difficult it is to invest how and why nobody is investing in this thing. How to add value. So this is our kind of approach to trying to add value between this mess, what we try to do. And we start with the four Gs that we also apply in our classic fund, uh, value fund. The first one is good, good business. Here is good assets. So low cost, low capital invested per unit, long life, please. Uh, infrastructures, you can buy the biggest mine in the world if you don't have a road, you don't have a desalination plant, you don't have a pipeline, it's worth zero. Safe jurisdiction, exploration potential, blah, blah. So this is the cash cost curve we want to be on the left, you know, the, the cheapest company. So this is an easy one. The second good would be good management. Uh, you know, we try to escape from financial people. Uh, we look for experienced people. I recommend you to go to a presentation, David Hayhorn, Greenlight, uh, Asset Management in 2015. He called the model frackers. So the frackers at that time were selling a story which was completely uh, misleading. It was, uh, it, was, it was false. They were selling IRRs of 30% and they were not talking about decline. They were not talking about amortization. This guy did a presentation that is fantastic. I don't have time to repeat it, but it, it's really on, on spot how the numbers in shale should have been done 10 years ago. And the US market would uh, have escaped uh, from losing a couple of hundred billion uh, dollars. 
so good management. Balance sheet, and I really apologize to Harvard for this, but uh, this is my mistake. Harvard management was a high level or uh, balance sheet which, which had a kind of uh, quite a bit of debt. And this is the resulting end over the years, you know. It was trading almost at 10 pounds. It's now trading at two. Um, and uh, yeah, nothing has changed. They were bought by, so this was Premier Oil uh, before. They, they were bought at very low price by Chrysler. Now it's Harbor Energy. And in the end, the message here is not against the company because now the company is clean from a balance sheet perspective, but uh, it's, it's never, never invest in this sector with a gear balance sheet because what we were discussing about, this cyclicality can kill any company, even if it is good management or good assets. And fourth is discount. We are value guys. We try to buy at a discount. We build models that try to uh, do all the valuations on mid-cycle. Here you need another extra effort. You need to calculate what is the mid-cycle price for every commodity. So we have an incentive price for every commodity, a kind of mid-cycle price for the commodity, which is not the average. Is the price where you think new investment will come. So in, in oil, is for instance, we our models are done with 85, 90 dollars Brent. Uh, copper, we use three and a half, a bit more, 3.7, etc. And once you have the supply model and the resulting equilibrium price, then you need to do the same with the company. So it requires a big effort. We try to buy at a discount to the mid-cycle numbers. And then we apply some, I will go fast here, some extra things for natural resources that we think can add uh, value. No majors. We don't like them. We are diversified, so it's like playing an index. We, they need to replace reserves, which are all cheap and very large, and it's very difficult. The marginal return is going down normally, and then they're diversifying into you know, some new fields like renewables at returns of 1 or 2 or 3 percent, institutional constraints, so they have an image problem, etc too large to grow, you know, there's a lot of, and then the, the, you know, the example we like to put is the performance between C and Q, which is an independent mid-sized producer and Shell in the previous cycle. You make a killing with the same old price in the independence because the majors normally, uh, I mean, they are slow movers. So no majors, no startups. We are not geologists. We are not banks. We don't need to fund anybody. We are not lawyers to understand the regulation of the new territory, etc. It's too risky, so no startups. Where to invest? This is what we call the SIA value bracket. We only invest in companies that are already producing because if you are not really producing, it's very difficult to get the numbers and everything is oversold. We don't like exploration. We don't like the initial part of the construction because normally you have overruns or perm permitting. You can make a killing, but it is risky. So we invest in things that are already Producing, number four, we try to go to safer geographies, but take a look to this chart. In processing commodities, China is the dominant player, more than 50% of most of the commodities, which is normal. And in extraction, okay, excluding the US, that more or less you can trust, more or less. You have companies like, you have countries like Congo, or, or China, or Indonesia, or Peru, or Chile, which with all respect, all due respect, are riskier. So let's say that the commodity complex is located and the resources are located in complicated areas. We try to escape from them, but you know, there's a level where you cannot escape because most of the resources are there. So we have investments in Congo. Yes, we have. We diversify the fund in order to protect the capital and protect your money and protect our money, which is invested in the fund. Basically, I could or we could decide to invest only in energy and metals, but we decided to open agri-food, agriculture and food and infrastructure in order to have more levels. We sometimes have some cash also. When we think that there is a crisis or something is going very wrong, we can have a little bit of cash and then play between these four uh, subsectors that are less correlated. Normally when you invest in oil and mining, it is 100% correlated between them and between China. So there's a, if China goes wrong, all this space goes down. So we can help a little bit here to fall less, investing in some other natural resources, for instance, in cement, where the, we've done relatively well in the past two years with cement companies. Commodity selection, number six. Uh, so yeah, you have the index, you have uh, what the 
what they commented in the beginning that the index long term is going to make six seven percent uh, we try to focus on uh, the commodities where we see scarcity okay so we are not going to play the sector or the index we are going to be very different and we hope that in a bull market which our thesis we can beat uh, the index by far our thesis now favor oil copper nickel uranium i'm adding salmon here uh, because we have a, a big investment there and we are not that keen on the other commodities although if they are very cheap we will buy them okay we will buy them well below intrinsic values or mid-cycle valuations Last but not least, we don't invest in commodities. I don't need to explain because it was explained earlier. If you invest in commodities, long term, you will be flat or inflation. If you invest in equities, you will have a 8% return. This is less, less time. I think it's like 20 years. It's a kind of 8% per year with a big, big difference with the only the commodity, only the commodity index. So investing companies, investing commodities through companies why because they generate cash flow and free cash flow they are clever management they reinvest and you have the reinvestment uh, growth so that's for the how we want to add a little bit of alpha or value we try it and it's pretty common sense and now last part of my presentation on the super cycle so we are convinced that we are now already in a super cycle oil as carlos was mentioning is a sta stable or growing for the next 15, 20 years. We've done a lot of numbers and numbers suggest that plateau could arrive in 15 years, 2035, 2040. This is beyond our investment horizon. So, I mean, our ability to forecast that is, is very low. So growing demand and uh, supply very, very depressed. CapEx and supply very depressed. Green metals, the call is very easy. Copper, nickel, lithium, demand is going to explode due to electrification and supply, as uh, Alberto was commenting, is very much constrained, either on ESG or on returns or on royalties or on taxes or whatever it is. It is very difficult to build a new mine. Valuation, we are still below mid-cycle, so it's not late, as, as Alex was mentioning. On valuation, we have a kind of grip on where the sector has to trade when we are here, when we are mid-cycle, when we are here, we are below mid-cycle, so it's a good moment to be there. And the uh, final comment is, ah, yeah, very important, because we are moving to an electric world, the transition, this transition is going to make this cycle longer. This is what we think. Normally, the cycle, we were commenting, all of us, that it's going to take 10, 15 years to bring supply. This year, this, this cycle looks very, very much longer because we need to change completely the generation mix of the world, which means that we're probably talking about a couple of decades at best. So, you know, we are hopefully that this will happen and then we, we have more time to, to enjoy with the Natural Resources Fund. Let me try to summarize what we think in oil. 100, to make it easy, 2022, 100 million barrels a day demand. Growth in the next seven years, 7 million barrels. One, a little bit less than 1 million barrel per day, which is a conservative target. Decline, 3, 4, 5%, 3%, 6 years is 20%. I don't know, 15 million barrels, 10 million barrels. This is the decline that you need that you need to add it. And then we have new projects, okay, coming that, yeah. So we have projects in basically Guyana, a little bit in Canada, a little bit in Brazil. Uh, Russia is going down. Shale, if oil prices are high, can be back. But basically, the 10 million barrels that Shale brought in 2011 will not happen again as far uh, I mean, w from what we know now, there's not a new 10 million, which means that sooner or later we have a gap between 15 to 20 million barrels in seven years. This needs to be invested now, now, because uh, an oil field takes, I don't know, five, six, seven years, the big ones. If we don't invest, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. So we need higher prices to incentivize uh, new projects. And you know what happens? that even with higher prices, we don't see investment. Why nobody's investing even at 90? Not nobody, but you know, kind of the marginal investment is not there. Why? Because you have ESG constraint, oil is pollution, and I don't want to invest there. And then we have the fear of peak demand, what Carlos was mentioning. People are convinced that demand will start failing 
in the next five years. So why should I invest in oil? And we think, we are convinced that this is not going to happen. Same with copper. Copper is even easier. I mean, this is a chart from Woodmac. And what they say is that, uh, yeah, mine supply in 2033 is, what we need is 30% of the current production, very much aligned with what Alberto from, from Atalaya was saying. For we run a model, supply demand with all the mines, so it's relatively easy. You have the mines, you have the projects, and you have the supply. Then your demand estimates, if you take average, they are easy. We have new mines until 2025. All are green fields, basically. There's no, sorry, all are brown fields. There's no really green fields here. After 2025, there's no more projects. And then demand is going to start growing from 2% to 4% because of the electrification. So we're going to need not half a million, but one million tons per year. And then, uh, who's going to build a mine? You're going to build a mine, 10 billion US dollars in Congo, or in Peru, that they are changing the, the one, the constitution, and, and in Chile, they raise the taxes, and in Mongolia, in the middle of the, so, we are aligned with Alberto, and we did the presentation differently. I mean, we are not coordinated, we have the same, the same opinion. Nuclear, it's almost, you know, the same story, Wind and solar are intermittent, as you well know, that's the problem. And we don't have still the technology to store the energy when it is produced, when there is sun and when there is wind. Until this storage is there, it's not going to work. We need the backup system. So, you know, for us, it's evident, well, there's no capacity to grow too much in hydro. So, you know, there's, there's only one way, is nuclear energy. And nuclear energy is there, it's working. We have small modular reactors. And, and we can use them for submarines, for boats, for some parts of the industry. You can have a small modular reactor in a steel plant, in a cement plant. So all this will come. And then nobody is investing in uranium because he, we had the disaster of Fukushima, 2011, if I'm not wrong. And since then, investment in uranium is very, very low. And you have the same problem as, as usual. So it's a pity that there's no more names in the, in the space. We only invest in two, in Cameco and and in Casa Tom Prom, Cameco is up a lot. It's super expensive, so I wouldn't advise to take a look now, but it will come down. I mean, you see this cycle. You know, we will have a lot of opportunities to, to be back there. And final chart for me, at least in this part, is, <laughs> is uh, what we are adding as a spice to the natural resources, which is salmon. So here you see the landings of, of fish, so the captures of, of cod uh, since uh, 100, 150 years, 200 years, and you know, it's, it's very obvious that, that fishing is under enormous pressure, so we have less and less fish. The only solution to maintain the level of production is aquaculture, and aquaculture is, is being developed. We invest in this theme through salmon farming, and now it is 15% of the fund, and, uh, and we are going to make good money there. Why? Because salmon, the capacity of salmon cannot grow. Why? Because two countries produce 75% of the global production, Norway and Chile. It is regulated. They want to control the biological issues so uh, that the fish is healthy and they don't get virus and stuff. So the production capacity is limited, limited, and demand is growing a lot. And not only this, all emerging markets, they don't eat fish. Well, not, not salmon. They eat fish, but not salmon. In China, consumption per capita is nothing. In India, it's nothing. So if we are able to export salmon to emerging markets, with all due respect, you know, in the end, it's the same story as the commodities we like. It's a problem in supply. Boom, supply cannot grow, cannot grow. And this is what we like. When supply cannot grow, the adjustment should come uh, via prices. Um, conclusion, we are convinced of the super cycle. Um, short term, we've been fighting with a recession this year um, and maybe in the next few months because everybody's convinced that we are going to a recession. China down, commodities down. And then we will buy like hell. We are ready to buy. We have cash. We have maybe the salmon part. If commodities go down, we will buy like hell. And then we will make a killing as we did in 2020 with the COVID where commodities collapsed and then we bought. Uh, because the long term is the important thing. I mean, I don't care there is a recession or not. What is important is all of us stay invested here for the next 10 years. That is very important, but we will have periods of pain, and pain in commodities minus 50%. It's not minus 10, it's minus 50, but it's just a mark to market. You know, the intrinsic value of our fund is 
50% higher than the current price and we think is going to be way, way above that in the future because the reinvestment of the free cash flow of good management will, will give us more. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, long term we discussed um, valuation and, and the length. We think that this cycle will, will take a couple of decades at least in some of the commodities. And uh, our final comment for a second, uh, this is what we offer to you all. So strategic value applied a little bit to commodities, small size, we are flexible and fast and you can talk to us. We have experience, although we failed and we failed with shale because we thought that shale would not come and we were long oil for a long time. We failed with Harbor, we failed with California resources. But what I, the message here is that we are learning here the hard way and we will not do the same mistakes again, maybe with a small position. Um, yeah, because the upside, you know, sometimes you have so much upside. You have a company which is a billion market cap and the upside, if the cycle goes well, um, be careful with the balance sheet, be careful with the assets, be careful with everything. Long term, again, sorry for repeating that. And, and yes, uh, you know, uh, partnership, this is from Warren Buffett, uh, partnership. We invest in companies as a partner and we want you or our investors to also be partners with us and, and try to profit from this, from this kind of exceptional cycle with the energy transition. So that's the, that's the message for, for today. We have time for one question now. So we have now in oil, <coughs> if you start from scratch, what we want to do is have 25% uh, in, in the four kind of infrastructure, oil, metals, and agricultural and food, 25 if you start from zero. Now we have one third in oil, one third in, in metals, 15% in salmon, and 15% in infrastructures. In Canadian oil signs were very bullish, and we have uh, three or four names in the natural resources, and it is gonna be 10% of the fund. Why we like them? Because uh, they have, it's a kind of a mine. So the, the oil signs are, the, the, the oil is there. They don't need to explore, they don't need to find. So they have 30, 40 years of reserves. If prices move up, these reserves will, will be almost forever. So for us, this is very interesting to avoid uh, exploration cost. And you know, this risk is, is, is avoided, which is a high risk. And this is 